Warriors was something that wouldn't leave me alone. Like the moment I was free from all of my Hamilton obligations, it was the first thing to raise its hand. And I think our duty is both to the ideas that don't leave us alone and also the ones that come along that you know you'd be kicking yourself forever if you didn't say yes to because you know you're going to learn so much. Hey, it's Guy Raz, and this is The Great Creators, the place where I have conversations with some of the most acclaimed actors, musicians, and performers of our time. And on the show today, playwrights Issa Davis and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Lin-Manuel Miranda and Issa Davis are the names in hip-hop theater. Issa has written the critically acclaimed plays Angela's Mixtape and Bull Rusher, which was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize in drama. Lin-Manuel, of course, is the genius behind In Heights and Hamilton. Their new project is a concept album. It's based on a 1970s thriller called The Warriors. The original film is about a gang in New York fighting its way from the Bronx all the way down to Coney Island after they were falsely accused of a crime. Now the question is, will this concept album become a Broadway show? So without further ado, here's my conversation with Lin-Manuel Miranda and Issa Davis. Enjoy. When did you first see this film, The Warriors? I saw it downstairs. <laughs> I was at my friend's house and his older brother had the VHS of it um, or rented the VHS of it. I'm not sure which. I was probably around four or five years old. Uh, too young to see this movie. Um, but like a lot of uh, movies I saw back then, there were no parents around and someone had a copy of VHS. <laughs> and I remember um, not only seeing it and, you know, Luther, the, the villain of the movie, just scaring the bejesus out of me. Um, Going back to it again and again, like my mental map of the movie of, of New York City really kind of was drawn by the Warriors. You know, there's that moment in the opening montage when Rembrandt's finger traces all the way from South Brooklyn up to the South Bronx. And I knew I lived closer to the end of that journey uh, than the beginning. And um, it was a movie I went back to over and over and would always sort of secretly thrill when there was a reference to it in hip hop music, which is mm -hmm. all the time, whether it's Wu-Tang or Common or LL Cool J as recently as his new release last month. Um, it was sort of like this secret New York movie and has always stayed with me. Um, so that's that was my first exposure to it. Okay, and you, you, the, the, I think the imperative word here is secret New York movie because it, it's not a well known film. I mean, it's sort of a cult, become a cult classic. But just for people who haven't seen it, I've been down a Warriors rabbit hole. It's basically the, the story of a bunch of rival gangs coming together in the Bronx to, um, I guess, declare a truce. But the, the, the guy who declares a truce, Cyrus, is killed. Uh, a group of, of gangsters called the Warriors from Coney Island are accused of this, and they have to escape, basically. <laughs> go yeah, they got to fight their way from up. the Bronx down to Brooklyn. Right, and they're the, then they've got to face the, the, the Furies, the Hi-Hats, the Boppers, the Lizzies, the Gramercy Riffs, all these different gangs, and they're scary. And I'm, I'm just kind of surprised that at age four you saw this film because that would have been kind of um, – it would have been kind of – you know, sort of kind of just shocking and, and scary and, and um, would have left an impression. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the jokes I have with Issa is that I, I came into this from a place of fear and she came in from a place of hope. Um, you know, I think that when you see it as a little kid, it's almost like a visual representation of all the things um, you're told to be scared of about New York. Um, you know, the wrong cop on the wrong night, falling into the subway tracks, uh, stepping into the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time, um, that sort of uh, good block, scary block mentality so many people people are warned about uh, New York. And um, and so it was, you know, it really uh, was a, a formative movie for me. And then when Issa came aboard, when I asked her to start writing this with me, one of the things that I think she so brilliantly latched onto was, and they're all lured there with the promise of peace and unity mm -hmm. and power. And what happens to that dream when Cyrus, who's the charismatic leader who's brought them all together, is killed? And I think Issa found a really ingenious way of keeping that promise, the dream of leaving your house and being able to get home at the end of the night um, as a powerful um, current of hope uh, throughout uh, our version of Warriors. All right, Issa, let me, wind, let me wind back for a second and 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 ask you, how did you first, I mean, I'm assuming when Lin-Manuel told you about the film, you had not ever heard of it? I mean, and that's actually a badge of shame because I should have seen it. 
as the hip hop head that I have been all my life, I mean, I really should have seen this film, but I hadn't, you know, it was just one of those things where I didn't have a friend's older brother with that on the VHS, you know, um, growing <laughs> up in, in Oakland and Berkeley, you know, I was watching like Throne of Blood and Kurosawa, you know, <laughs> and- <laughs> Also and great movie. Really great movie. You know, um, I was watching Blood of the Condor. I was, you know, um, so I really came at it knowing that it had this, um, you know, imprimatur of hip hop, right? That that there are so mm. many different people who had sampled it, right? And that it was scripture. Um, but I also knew that watching it now, that it has a lot of kind of rickety, old, you know, antiquated attitudes uh, that the characters have, that the overall narrative holds, and that that was something that we could really dispense with. And what we could go with was, you know, this incredible uh, journey that the warriors go on, which is how do you survive when you're falsely accused and you have no weapons? and you're trying to get home, um, and and you are faced with, as you said, all of these scary obstacles, and yet they make it with some losses, but they make it. And that was so powerful for me. And I think it's something that all of us, no matter who we are, can really um, hold to as a, a kind of hope, is like that they're victorious at the end. Th- this story um, I, is based on a Xenophon um, epic that was right. written, you know, in ancient 400 times. 400 BCE. And like, yeah. Like many great, um, you know, modern adaptations, Hades Town or Brother Where, Where Art Thou, you know, it's based on these ancient stories, these epics. Um, Lin Manuel, when you when you came, I mean, you first saw this as a little kid, but when did the idea start to kind of percolate in your mind about? Maybe doing something with this because we'll get to what it – obviously, it's a, it's a concept album right now. It's not a, a stage play or anything. But when did you start to think there's something there there? There's something to do that, that I could do with this? Yeah, uh, a classmate incepted me. Uh, I have a classmate from Wesleyan named Phil Westgren. Um, he had gotten a job after college working for – uh, producer Larry Gordon, who was one of the producers on the original film. And shortly after my f- Broadway debut within the Heights uh, in 2009, he emailed me and was like, hey, I'm working for Larry Gordon, Warriors the Musical, what do you think? Um, and I wrote him back pretty quickly, like same day, like, oh, it'll never work, here's why. Um, and wrote him back uh, like, I love that movie. I think action movies are very tough to adapt. Best of luck. Keep me posted. Um, And then, but like he incepted me and like that Mm. idea went somewhere in my brain and kind of grew uh, to the point where by the time I had come up from air after the phenomenon of Hamilton, not just getting the show on stage, but acting in it for a year and having my life completely changed by it. um, By the time I got to asking myself, what do I want to write next? Um... Warriors was there and it was ready and it was, um, I had the idea to uh, gender flip the Warriors um, Mm. after seeing some uh, particular online cruelty uh, called Gamergate that happened in 2015. Right, because in the uh, film, the Warriors are all, are all male. Yeah, it's a male gang. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and in our, on our album, it's a, it's a female gang. Um, and, And really that came about because I'd seen what had happened in Gamergate online. I was very online in <laughs> 2015. It was like the Hamilton phenomenon. I was very addicted to Twitter. Um, and, you know, it was this phenomenon of these men just posting women's addresses online and doxing them and and sort of not caring about the consequences of that. And I remember thinking that's such a Luther thing to do. Mm. Luther is the villain of the warriors. He's the He's one the who, guy shoots who shoots Cyrus. Shoots Cyrus. Right. Yeah. He shoots Cyrus. He points at the warriors, says mm. they did it and goes on his way and i just remember connecting those two kind of cruel chaotic acts and that flipped the warriors into and into a what if of well what if the warriors are women the story is the same but the warriors are women and every 
plot point got complicated and made more interesting and also more than anything carved out our own lane as something to write that would be distinct from the movie but still a love letter to the movie and so um that i started you know it was a couple of years just trying to get the rights i had to get the rights from paramount and the rights to the underlying the underlying rights from the Saul Urich novel on which the movie's based um and then once i had him i called isa and we got to work Okay, so Issa, when when he when Lin Manuel approached you with this idea, um, I mean, did you automatically think this is a stage play? This is like this because it, you know, it's it feels to me when when I see the the film like it could be, or or I mean, were you skeptical? Were you like I don't know about this? What, what was your reaction? Um, well, first of all, I was just so excited and grateful to be able to work with Lynn no matter what. So I was just like, if he's game for the challenge, then I am. But my first reaction, honestly, was I thought this should be a video game. And then Lynn was like, it is. I play it. And it's a great video game. <laughs> Rockstar Games, PlayStation 2. Yeah. I was so I was like, are you sure you you, you really want to make some music out of this? And and he was like, yeah. So Um, So really, I just was, it was just this really exciting thing to do. Um, We're actually in the place where we wrote the majority of this album. We're in the Drama Bookshop, um, which is this beautiful refuge in the middle of Times Square where you can come and read books, uh, read plays, uh, you know, books about the performing arts. And, um, And we just kept throwing things, you know, in to the pot and just sort of like, does this make sense? Does this work? And there were a lot of questions along the way um, because of the fact that Lynn had the film just burned into his DNA, right? And I was coming at it from this fresh perspective. Then we kind of got to meet in the middle and um, find out what exactly makes this a woman's story now, you know? Um, who is that? person that is played by Mercedes Rule in the film, right? Who is that going to be if it's She's a women? cop and uh, right. an undercover she beca- cop. She becomes film. an undercover cop. So we're like, and let's- probably the most famous actor to emerge from that film. True. I mean, and, you know, David Patrick Kelly and, and James Remar, um, who play uh, Luther and Ajax, respectively, we also got to have them on the record, which is pretty incredible. But what we got to do in that scene um, or take that we took that scene and made it a song is um, to take Ajax, right? James Remar in the film is the one who's approaching Mercedes Rule, who's left herself there, you know, just like very enticingly. And then, of course, she flips and, and arrests him. What we got to do was pretty much take that scene verbatim and have our Ajax, played by Amber Gray, um, approach this you know, kind of lecherous perv who's like in a trench coat, just like total sleaze ball, you know, come and hang out with me. And um, and then that person turns out to be this undercover cop, right? So, um, but again, it's just, what is it that I, as a woman, have gone through? I mean, that's something, talking about the Bay in, in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up, how many times did I have people flash me how many times was I at a bus stop or in the laundromat and like suddenly there's some guy who's like talking to me and I'm like, I'm eight years old, like stay away from me. So just having all of these realities um, that that women and girls face be part of our narrative was really important to the writing of these songs. I, I think um, one of the things that, that I just want to clarify for people who have not obviously seen the Warriors and are listening to this or watching this, basically it's it's an epic, right? The the, the Warriors are trying to escape from the Bronx and get back to Coney Island, and they face a, a series of trials, whether it's rival gangs or the police or you know these um, sort of women who are seducing them in the film. There's an undercover cop played in the film by Mercedes Rule who um, ends up arresting one of the characters and. Um, and and I wonder, uh, Lynn, from from your perspective, having grown up in New York, um, I, I know this film takes place in the '70s. But d- it, from your perspective, does it does it reflect? I mean, obviously, it's it's fiction, it's a thriller, it's almost like science fiction, like Escape from New it's York. So or, you stylized. Know, no, I, I never saw a gang it... with clown makeup and pinstripes <laughs> growing up. Right. Or or right. Exactly. <laughs> um, but are there elements of the film or attitudes or just perspectives that that in your view, do, did reflect 
reality in some way? I think, I mean, I think that was what was so thrilling and tantalizing about the film for me as a kid was that, that that's what the subways looked like when I was a kid. That's what New York mm. looked like at night when I was a kid, except it was even more beautiful. You know, the, the sidewalks always kind of wet and gleaming. Um, and um, it was this gorgeous and dangerous version of a New York that I both remember and never was because it's also Walter Hill really stylized it. He always, you know, something he said to us over and over again, and we were very lucky to have his blessing and mentorship while we were making this album, was... I want the personalities to feel larger than life, but the emotions to feel real. Um, and, 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 you know, I think the other thing that felt true, and, and I think Issa deserves a lot of the credit for bringing this to the piece, was, um, you know, this notion of the birth of hip hop emerging out of the ashes hmm. of a bankrupt New York City and a burnt down South Bronx. And these crews going from gangs for protection to becoming community organizations and becoming dance crews and battle crews like hip hop is born and emerging um, around the same time as the Warriors was made in that New York that we see in that movie. And um, and so that, you know, that's why the first rap lyric we hear is this is the sound of something being born, even though there's a lot of fighting and there's a lot of like epic struggle. Something something purer and more incredible is, is going to come out of the struggle. They're 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 different sort of clear genres that you hear on on the record. I mean, hip hop, obviously, but punk, disco, new wave sounds. I mean, all those sort of sounds were sounds of New York in that period of time. Yeah, yeah, that that's the fun is I'll, I'll never get tired of, right? I mean, it's almost like a, a joke that all of my musicals are set in New York, but there's so many New Yorks inside New York. You know, my mm. first show in the Heights was really, writing the musical landscape of the neighborhood I grew up in in northern Manhattan. Then I dug two layers before the topsoil and realized George Washington was standing there. Aaron Burr lived on 162nd Street. Hamilton moved up to 145th Street uh, in the later part of his life and was like, oh, this is also New York. It's just a few le centuries down. Mm. Um, and so with this, the fun of writing something that is set in 1979, but, you know, written from the perspective of 2024, is we get to play in all these other um, communities and soundscapes that were emerging at that time. And that's everything from punk to new wave to writing sort of music for the, the queer ballroom scene that's also emerging and gives birth to Paris is burning and ballroom culture uh, in the form of the hurricanes on skates. Um, and so it's it was... Um, when you're writing about New York, you get to write about write in a lot of different genres. Yeah. And I, I think also, you know, it's a testament to our producer, Mike Elizondo, that, um, you know, he also has that versatility to play in all of those genres and knew exactly what it is that we needed in terms of sound. And um, I mean, the trifecta of the three of us, I mean, we're all such eclectics. You know, it's like I grew up playing classical piano and flute, you know, and also at the very same time that I was playing Mike Kabalewski and WC, I was trying to work on my backspins on the linoleum in the home ec room, you know. So um, there's this way in which like all pop of all origins, world music of all origins, um, you know, whether it's classic, you know, so-called high or low, you know, all of those things fit in uh, the New Yorks that we were trying to get at in this album. Um, you mentioned Michael Elizondo, who I know, Lynn, you worked with him before, I believe, on Encanto. Um, right. And he's also kind of a legendary Grammy winning producer. Um one um, very legendary figure on this record is Lauren Hill, who plays Cyrus, the, the the gang leader who's trying to bring about peace and is is killed early in the film. How how did you? I mean, she's kind of notoriously, um, you know, private and um, doesn't you know sort of do a lot of things like this. How did you guys get her to to agree to do this? <laughs> prayer, prayer, uh, it, it, pr prayer, prayer. Um, but it's funny, that's our most asked question. It, it, it's almost like the magician's question of like, wait, yeah. how'd you do that? How do you do that trick? Uh, yeah. yeah, right. That's, so true. And, that's really true. And, um, you know, I think the one th sort of toe in the door we had was um, her manager had shared with me that she admired Hamilton. Um, and so we said, we have this new project. Issa and I like painstakingly wrote her uh, sort of a love letter and why she was 
our only choice to play Cyrus and someone that we felt like, I mean, listen, it's how many years later and we still rate Miseducation as like the best hip hop album of all time. Like Apple Music just rated, rated it that like it's in everyone's top five. And so who has the musical and moral authority to gather us in the name of peace? So in a lot of ways, even beyond gender, there was just no plan B to play Cyrus. Like that's the figure who can unite us. Um, and just sort of checking in like every week, every couple of weeks, you know, she had a very busy schedule touring the anniversary of Miseducation last year. And then one day we got a Dropbox and it had vocal files. And we had, yeah. we had sent her the track with a temp uh, vocal uh, on it. And she came back with not just her vocals, but background vocals with vocalists she works with. Um, she really kind of did her own additional arrangements on top of what we sent her. And um, it's the the highlight of our careers that she said yes. So so did you ever have any interaction with her? Was it or was it just this mysterious Dropbox file? That it was came? all I mean she protects her piece. It was all via her manager. And I, I and again I understand I mean as much as she's gone through in the industry um yeah. and continues to go through um it's it, it makes sense to me, you know, from the outside that you really have to protect your energy in order to do what it is that you have to do. I mean, I know that this is the case for so many artists, right? Where they're just very specific, you know, about what it is that they allow into their silo, you know? And um, and I think that, you know, Ms. Lauren Hill was very, uh, she, she was very uh, much in touch with us via her manager. But no, we never actually talked directly to her or worked with her, you know, in the studio. It was really just a game of of back and forth. I mean, it must have been amazing that one day there's like a an, an in, in your inbox, your email inbox is a message and it's just a Dropbox <laughs> and you open that up. It was in Not, my texts. Yeah. Guy. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't even in my inbox. Yeah. And he was at a photo shoot. And got this and then listened, fell. And I just texted, yeah. I texted Here, Issa that. Move it over yeah. to the camera so we can all see. Yeah. Oh, wow. There you go. <laughs> I just texted yeah. that to Issa. And, and she knew <laughs> that that meant Miss Hill had sent us wow. the vocals. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And it was, it was exactly what you wanted, like right away? It was beyond what we wanted. Yeah. I mean, what do you do? I mean, do you like send she, feedback and say, can you change this? Can you change that? I mean, I mean, there was back and forth. There was back and forth about the final mix um, okay. because, mm -hmm. you know, we wanted to get that right and we wanted to honor all of her impulses and they're all in there. And then also, but also there's vocals of the Gramercy riffs who are like, you know, chanting and saying, hey, so it was it was a meld of what she brought to the table and what we had laid down. Wow. Um, Lynn, there's a, a very now sort of well-known video of you at the White House in 2009. It's just endearing, lovely video of you rapping about Alexander Hamilton. It's very fun to watch because it's awkward and, and people are kind of looking at like, what is he t rapping about? Because you, you were not as well, obviously, as well known. And it was before Hamilton became Hamilton. At that time, you were writing a concept album. You'd read the Cherno book. People know this story. You'd read the Cherno book. And then you were like, this is a record. This is a concept album. It was not a play. and But quickly it became a stage show. Um, I can't help but think of similar parallels with this, that that this is, is – it is a concept album. You have an album out. But that it, it seems like the natural sort of next step would be to figure out how to mount this as a show. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, again, you work with the clay of your idea and it yeah. starts to take shape. And some of that is you shaping it and some of it is like telling you what it wants to be. And with Hamilton, it very clearly was becoming a play. Like I, that's just that's what I knew how to write. And and the collaborator I was I was working with were like, well, let's get David in here. And we're like, oh, I got to write to David. And and that's just the way the the wood was was being shaped and formed um it's liberating to me to think of these things as albums first to be able to score them without the burden of and they'll need 16 extra bars for their costume change um or we need a longer outro because we've got to move the set right um, yeah and then with this i mean with warriors compound that by the fact that there's a ton of characters in this thing. Um, you know, they meet every kind of character on their way from the Bronx down to Coney. And 
to liberate ourselves from figuring out how to stage it by going, but what's the vibe of the Turnbull ACs? And could we get Mark Anthony? And could we <laughs> record with his orchestra? Right. And can um, Mark so- Anthony double as Luther? It's like <laughs> these questions that you have when you have small casts. Right. And so, so for us, this was very freeing from a writing perspective because um, I don't think we ever thought about staging. We just thought about what is the best music to tell this story. Now, we're both theater artists. I think we loved working together on this and we'd love to figure out what the next step of it would be. But it would not be this album. It would be the adaptation of this album. And as someone who struggled with the fact that Hamilton was this enormous success, but we can only serve the meal 1,400 people at a time in one theater every night and and reckoned with the world banging down our door as we serve that meal. I feel so great that everyone gets the thing we made on Friday. <laughs> yeah, it's not yeah. a cast album of the thing we made. It's not a reflection of the thing we made. It's the thing we made, and it's here for you, and everyone can listen to it. And it, it's, I mean, it is a very visual, I mean, it's a story, right? You are in Van Cortland Park and then you're at Gray's Papaya at one point and they're at the cemetery in the Bronx and then they're at Union Square and then back to Coney Island at the end. And so you visualize it. I mean, you understand the story because the words are clear um, and and there's a narrative, right? And so I can't help but think of like Tommy, right? Which was an album first, yeah. or yeah. I think Hades Town was an album yep. first, right? Totally. And so Jesus Christ Superstar. Jesus, mm-hmm. and and they those were so visual, right? And so it seems like, and it can be a standalone thing, right? It's a story, it's a clear story. There's a narrative, but you can also visualize it. You can, and I, I wonder, your you told your friend like 20 years ago, this this there's no way you can mount this as a play. Do you still agree with that assessment? No, I still think it's hard. You know, and again, like mainly what I told him was action movies and musicals are always fighting for the same real estate. Like when you can't talk anymore, the emotion heightens and in an action movie you fight and in a musical you burst into song and dance. Um, And so what's the challenge of reconciling those things? And I think it set us free to record this as an album first because we just worried about the best way to tell the story so that you could understand it um, musically. So sometimes we dilate that moment. You know, the fight in Union Square is like a painful moment by moment accounting of the fight that's taking place. Whereas Sick of Running, you hear some bats being swung, but you have to imagine the fight. Like at the beginning of the song, they're running. At the end, they've beat the ba- the baseball furies. And so I think we've created a roadmap to how this could work uh, theatrically if we decide to take that next step. Um, but it was liberating to just score it instead of trying to solve it. Yeah. And just to, and also, I mean, we did, as you know, really want to make the story ultra clear. Um Every playlist, every album already has a narrative shape that comes from, you know, what's emotionally and rhythmically evoked from the songs being placed in a certain sequence. So that's already happening. But then, you know, I mean, Lynn knows this so well. I'm just like such a stickler about every single detail and making sure that, you know, like if we have them throwing a bottle of that's a Molotov cocktail. Like that means we ha- actually have to set up and have all of the ingredients to make a Molotov cocktail earlier yeah. in the piece. You know, Lisa was like, we have to say that she's drinking from a bottle of gin so that we can throw the bottle of gin later. It can't come out of nowhere. You know, I mean, these are the kinds of things that my Virgo moon will do. Um, but, you know, <laughs> it's it's that I, I, I love that what we have is something, as Lynn said, that you can completely visualize and that you feel like you're there and that it's all possible, you know? Um, and and that's all just through sound. It's a sonic experience. I, I'm curious how you guys work together. You're both very busy. Obviously, you say you had Bull Rusher as a, you're nominated for a, for a Pulitzer Prize. Um, Lynn, you've got, I think, a new Disney film coming out at the end of this year. I think at The Lion King that you've written the music for. And both of you have multi- lots of projects going on at once. How do you... I mean, were you physically in the same room working on these? There's a lot of songs in this record. It's just I, I was listening to it over the last couple of days, and I, I was just astounded at the amount of work that had to go into creating this story and these songs, and and they're so intricate. How did you guys 
do this together? Was it like Google Docs? Was it meeting up? Was it? <laughs> the answer is yes to everything you're suggesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but also mostly in person. You know, yeah. we, we're, we're talking to you from the drama bookshop. We'd meet in the basement every Tuesday. We'd create deadlines for ourselves. We would do week-long retreats where we would just go somewhere and write and, and lock up together and, and write. Right, um, and we did a really great trip where we replicated the Warriors trip from, you know, the Bronx all the way down to Coney. Um, and did and, you walk? Yeah, it, we, or walked, did you we, just, we, we walked. We we walked and took. Well, no, it. we took the train and walked. We walked when they walked. Like we walked from right, Van Cortlandt right. Park to Woodland Cemetery. Yeah, and then we took the train down to Ninety Sixth Street. Yeah, um, and actually, the the conclave in the movie was actually filmed at Ninety Seventh and Riverside. So we we took a little detour there. Yeah, because they come out of the train at Grace Papaya, which is Seventy Second Street. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are all of these kinds of you know discrepancies between the actual geography and then what we're supposed to believe in the film. Yeah. By the way, is coconut champagne really champagne? It's not champagne. It's just coconut. It's not. I used to think it was when I was a little kid. I have been <laughs> told a lot. So weird. So weird. But it's I've got never little coconut one. bits in it. Yeah. It's delicious. Yeah. I've never eaten a hot dog there. Are they as good as people say they are? They're good and they're cheap. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's like <laughs> that's the point. I, I, which is why they're still there after all these years. Like, yeah. Now people send me selfies. The people who have heard the album send me selfies when they're on 72nd and Broadway because right. It's you can see it in the movie and you can see it now. You know, there's there are gangs of New York and then there's hot dog gangs of New York. So there's that rivalry between <laughs> Grace Papaya and Papaya King, you know, which like keeps flaring up here and there. And then, of course, Nathan's is Coney Island's uh, right. hometown right. team. Right. Yes, of course. I'm 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 curious how you compartmentalize all the different projects, both of you, because you're writing plays and you're writing music for films and you're thinking, I mean, I have to assume that at any given time, both of you have probably 10 or 15 ideas, most of which will never see the light of day, but they're just like, like, you know, the, the what's, what's it called before a star becomes a star? You know, it's just like the, in, it's in the universe floating out there. How do you kind of organize those different ideas in your brain, especially when you're really working on something and then the next day or the next week, you've got to shift focus to something entirely different. Well, I think the secret for me is I'm a terrible multitasker. Um, and when I get overwhelmed, if I have projects that pile up and that's happened to me sometimes <laughs> beyond my understanding a couple of the times, I'm thinking of when I was editing Tick, Tick, Boom and writing the last songs for Encanto, that was a very tough 24 hours a day time. But I, I, the way I, I kind of mentally shift on it is I think of them as classes um, as opposed to like, I have to do this. It's I get to do this. And like, I also don't compartmentalize. Like if I hear something that feels great or we come up with something and it doesn't work with warriors, like I go over to Mufasa and I'm inspired in another direction. Like I have no, you know, there's a, there's a baseline in quiet girls mm. that I took from the first musical I wrote when I was 16 years old. Um, I'm, I'm all about stealing from myself if I need to. And, and also seeing how things inform each other. I mean, that's, that's sort of the fun of this. Um, we're cross pollinating all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, sometimes I, I was writing Mufasa concurrently with this. And I think there's a bounce in Mufasa that wouldn't have existed if we weren't also working on warriors at the same mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think for me, it's um, just like Lynn was saying, it's sort of like, you know, you're always thinking about everything unconsciously all the time, just like Warriors was just kind of hanging out in his head for years. And I think that happens like once an idea, you know, sort of like first, the first flint of the idea is, is struck, then you're just, it's just there. And, you know, you might be consciously starting to work on something, but then that thing is just always just kind of smoldering back there. Um, but you're right. I mean, for me, because of the, I'm also moving a lot between, I mean, we're the same in this, like writing, performing. And for me, it's like writing sometimes, you know, things without music and then writing music. And I actually really need having all of these different disciplines that actually really serves me to be able to move between something that is much more introverted um, and then something that is much more extroverted, you know, something that really is going to activate like one, like light up one portion of my brain and then 
the rest is going to be like for my body to like release all of that energy. So I actually find it really crucial to be able to hold all of these different projects and all of these different disciplines at once because it creates a really great balance. Well, were there moments, and I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to assume there were moments, but what what would you do in moments where you hit a block, right? Like there's a famous Brian Eno card deck, Oblique Strategies. I have that. I have it too. I don't know if people use it a lot, but it's like, right, switch instruments or, you know, jump on one foot and squawk like a chicken. It's designed to break blocks, right? And And I have to imagine when you're just, when you're really in it, there are moments where you just, you're like, this sucks. Oh, we just can't. This this isn't sounding right. What do you? What were some of the things you would do to kind of break through that? Yeah, I mean, I think part of growing up and and growing your craft is learning that blocks are not a thing. Blocks are just like they're just the steps on the road to the next thing. Right. And on. you know, approaching the empty piece of paper from a different angle. You know, I had the good fortune of Issa's monologues. Issa would sometimes write a monologue for a character and I would grab mm. one line from it and go, here's the name of the song. Thank you, Issa. And like build from there. Or, um, you know, sometimes it was as simple as taking a walk. Um, you know, one of the things I like about writing in the bookshop is all the best plays and musicals ever written are just upstairs. Um, so go take a walk, read a Sondheim quote, come back downstairs and get back to work. Yeah, I'm a big walker too. You know, all of the things that just uh, start to move you out of that snarled place creatively. Um, and that's the thing. It's like every single time I've had trouble, you know, like I, I remember when I was writing Bull Rusher and I was just like, how does this all come together at the end. I, I'm not sure. And I remember walking, walking, walking. I walked by City Hall, you know, and I went through the park there. And then I was just like, ah! I figured out who Bull Rusher's mother is, you know? Um, and it was just from putting one foot in front of the other. But I think, like Lynn is saying, you know, once you reach a certain level of craft, you understand that you simply have to just keep showing up. And sometimes your showing up is laying back. And sometimes it's pushing forward. You know, it's like, are you going to like flex or flow, flex or flow? Um, and we I'm trying to think if we had any specific moments like where we were sort of I know that when we were trying to get to Quiet Girls, I went back and forth about a lot of different ways. And Quiet Girls, a track that, is a track. on That's the album, right. That's think. right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I think we were just trying to figure out where exactly to locate this in terms of sound yes. because they're just when you talk about you know there's there's like all this house music that we could go to and there's so many different genres within house you know is this is this deep house is this t more techno um and and also just trying to figure out what the quiet girls are saying or not the quiet girls but the hurricanes are saying um, because we don't want it to be like, oh, you know, here's this queer and trans gang who are just going to, you know, give everybody a lesson and be like, you know, right. the magicals. No. We don't want that. Um, but also, how how do they speak to what the warriors are going through at this very, you know, sort of interesting fulcrum in the narrative? Um, and it took us a while to find that exact balance of what that was. You know, quiet girls don't make it home. And they're saying what you have to do. Well, when you is wrote that down, I knew we were off to the races. Like <laughs> quiet girls don't make it home is such a scary but like interesting image. And I was like, OK, that's that's the hook. And then I think we built outwards from there. Yeah. And, and I think also, you know, we sort of discovered that that's. Some, it's one thing that's said, which is something I think that happens throughout this album, is that, you know, there's one thing that's said and then it's countered. And so, mm. you know, there's Quiet Girls Don't Make It Home. And then you'll see if when you listen to the record that some of the characters, you know, decide to be louder and, you know, do they make it home or not? Yeah, I, I love the story of walking through. Um, New York City and coming up with a character for Bull Rusher, which takes place in Mendocino County in Northern California. That's right. And having to walk away from home in order to write about home. I mean, it's yeah. kind of different than Lynn in, in that way, but I think it's something that I've done as an artist. Um, Lynn, I can't, I know that the two of you have known each other for a long time, and I can't help but think part of this project was also an excuse for you to work with Issa, because I, I think, right, I mean, you hadn't really worked together until this point. 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, Issa and I met uh, when Passing Strange was off Broadway and my debut musical In the Heights was off Broadway. Mm -hmm. And then we both went to Broadway and we were the black and brown musicals on Broadway. And, um, you know, we were pitted against each other in, against amidst odds makers for the Tonys, but we had nothing but love and respect for each other's shows. I mean, if you want any further proof, see how many Passing Strange alums have been in Hamilton over the years, like all of them. Um, and so, you know, I knew Issa was an incredible writer. I knew Issa also really believed in that intersection of hip hop and theater uh, that I like to play in. And so um, I just felt like she would have great ideas that I wouldn't have and and would just make the thing infinitely richer. And she has. Yeah, I, I've just been, I, what a blessing to be able to work with Lynn and not only work with Lynn, but hang out. Like we're <laughs> homies, you know what I mean? And and at this point have truly like our, our neurons and dendrites have just started to kind of interweave and we pretty much become like one single brain. Um, but, you know, I just have been such an admirer of his work and what it is that he's been able to do. It's obvious throughout the world <laughs> what his impact has been on the culture. Um, and yet we're both just out here trying to write things, you know, and, and continue to explore as artists. And when you have a collaboration like this, that just can be so fertile and just bring both our shared aesthetics and then also our aesthetics that are just, you know, very disparate. Um, it's, it's like really, really exciting. It's really exciting. Lynn, I wonder what, what is the criteria for you um, on whether you're going to pursue a project? Because as I said earlier, like there are probably 20, 30 things in your mind and then you're probably inundated with incoming pitches all the time. Like, so, you know, uh, obviously, you know, you, you did Moana. It's just a beautiful that I, I remember watching that movie on an airplane crying. Me too. Sitting next to somebody and they're, wa they're looking at me and I'm crying on an airplane. Of course, airplanes do make you cry, apparently. True. But that film is so beautiful. Um, and, you know, Tick, Tick, uh, Tick, Tick, Boom and Lion King and all these different projects you work on. There's so many different things that come in to how do you know or determine what you want to do? I mean, I'm assuming you have to love it first. Yes, you have to love it first because you know it's years of your life and it's not just one good idea. Like one good idea doesn't power an album and it doesn't power a musical. It has to be an idea that opens avenues of other ideas that will strengthen the core thing. Um, if you have that idea and you feel the roads narrowing, like you're on the wrong path. And I think that you know, just like I described for you earlier, Warriors was something that wouldn't leave me alone. Like the moment I was free from all of my Hamilton obligations, which included scheduling the ham for hams outside the theater, creating the Hamilton mixtape, which was the remixes with all the other, these other artists who had fallen in love with that show. It was the first thing to raise its hand and be like, you're not you're not done with this idea. Phil Westgren implanted in your brain. Um, and I think that you know, I think our duty is both to the ideas that don't leave us alone, that we carry around like luggage all our lives. I mean, I saw this pretty young, so I've been carrying this one around for a long time. And also the ones that come along that you know you'd be kicking yourself forever if you didn't say yes to, because you know you're going to learn so much. You know, for me, Mufasa, I was pretty burnt out after writing Encanto. I was like, I have given it mm. everything I have. I was also locked up with my family uh, after COVID. I was like, I'm good. Thank you, Disney. It's been a great run. And then, uh, you know, Barry Jenkins and this amazing script come along. Mm. And I was like, I'm going to learn so much learning, like working with Barry Jenkins and working for Barry Jenkins. And um, I get to play in this playground where all the best musicians have played from Elton John to Beyonce to Lebo M. Like I'm going to learn so many more things from my toolbox from being in that room. Um, so that those are always sort of the two things. It's the things that don't leave you alone and the things you know you're going to learn from. That's That's how I choose. Do you – how do you guys want people to – I mean I think of Hamilton and family – I mean there were literally hundreds of thousands of families in cars driving all around the United States, maybe around the world singing Hamilton, right, on road trips. How do you want people to – I don't know, to uh, you know, assimilate this, this record? This album? To, I think – This you know, album, yeah. We just – I think we want – well, we want people to take it in in – 
the ways that they want to take it in in every which way, you know, whether that's headphones, in a car, um, in a living room. But I think the thing that we really are excited about is bringing back album listening, you know, mm -hmm. listening through the entirety. The, yes, the start to top finish, to yeah. bottom, Rudy to the tootie, you know, just listen to the whole <laughs> thing without you know, getting up and and like, oh, let me just like check my social for a minute. No, stay with the characters, stay and see what happens to you inside. And this is something that, of course, I think all of us got to do as kids, especially with vinyl, right? You would just turn the record player on and you would sit there and you would stare at the cover of the album and you would read the liner notes and it was just this very immersive experience. And so I know that a lot of people experience the Warriors in the way that Lynn did, where it was this ritual, hey, it's Friday night, what are we gonna do? Let's watch the Warriors, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone would just put it on and do it. Um, go through that process of going up to the Bronx and back down to Coney. and. We want people to experience the album in that same way, you know, getting together with other people and just listening through the whole way and seeing what happens. I, I imagine them listening to it the same way I listened to Jesus Christ Superstar as a kid, like on my parents' living room carpet, yeah. like with my finger along on the lyrics, you know, in addition to it being able to stream everywhere and the vinyl being out on Friday, we'll also have a PDF on warriorsalbum.com. So if you are like me and you like to scroll along to the lyrics, like we will have that available to you for free. Yeah. And they'll be the right ones. They'll be the right ones, not ones that, you know, people invented. Like how when I heard flash dance, I thought it was, you know, take your mm. pants down, make <laughs> it happen. I didn't think That's it was a very passion. different movie. Yeah, it's a very different movie. <laughs> very different. Yeah. I have an idea for you. <laughs> I think you should do, I mean, to pile on the work, I think you should do an audio tour of the Warriors, like both of you guys narrating an audio walking tour and subway tour of New York City. They'd hear a lot of panting, a lot of panting. <laughs> like, yeah. Just listen, there's a, there's a, that's a hill up to Woodlawn Cemetery. It would not be as fun as you think it would be just, ah, ah, ah. I know. But, you know, when we I'm took, open to it. When we took that trip, you know, we were in Woodlawn Cemetery a long time. Even getting there from Van Cortland is a walk up a hill. Mm. And and yeah, Lynn the was did it fast. We I know they really did. And and Lynn was just kind of like, okay, uh, where do we go? Where are we? And I'm like, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. Like you know, the universe will help us. Pronoia. We'll find the train station we need to get to. We were in Woodlawn a long time, and then we finally got to the train. But I was all about us feeling that experience that the Warriors had of, you know, not knowing where they were. I wanted us to have it, too. Mm. Yeah. Lin-Manuel Issa, thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Hey, thanks for watching my conversation with Lin-Manuel Miranda and Issa Davis. Their new concept album is called The Warriors, and it's out now. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to the channel. We release a new conversation every week. And, of course, we are an audio podcast. If you want to listen to the show, just search for The Great Creators wherever you listen to podcasts like Spotify, Amazon, or Apple Music. I'm Guy Raz, and this has been The Great Creators. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here next week.